establish and promote the conduct of three stricts and three earnests. March 9th, 2014. Main points of the speech at the deliberation session of the Anwai delegation at the second session of the 12th National People's Congress. Promoting good party conduct is always high on our agenda. We will fall short of our aims if this program tails off and we become lax in the later stages. Leading officials at all levels should enforce standards of good conduct on themselves and others. Be strict in self-development, the exercise of power and self-discipline. Be earnest in making plans, opening up new undertakings, and upholding personal integrity. Being strict in self-development means that leading officials should strengthen their sense of party awareness, stand firm in support of the ideals and principles of the party, cultivate integrity, pursue lofty goals, make a point of distancing themselves from vulgar interests, and resist unhealthy practices and evil influences. Being strict in the exercise of power means that leading officials should exercise power in the interests of the people. Exercise power in accordance with rules and regulations. Keep power within the confines of systemic checks and neither seek privileges at any time nor abuse power for personal gain. Being strict in self-discipline means that leading officials should respect discipline and always be ready to apply the rod to themselves. Guard against all temptations when alone. Be prudent. Engage in diligent self-examination. Abide by party discipline and state laws. And uphold integrity in governance. Being earnest in making plans means that leading officials should take facts as the basis for work planning, ensure that all ideas, policies, and plans are in line with actual conditions, objective laws, and scientific principle, and avoid being overly ambitious and divorced from reality. Being earnest in opening up new undertakings means that leading officials should be down-to-earth in their approach to their duties, be pragmatic and solid in their work, be bold in taking on responsibilities and facing problems, and be adept at solving problems. They should strive to create concrete results that will stand up to being tested by practice, by the people, and by time. Being earnest in upholding personal integrity means that leading officials should remain loyal to the party, to the organization, to the people, and to their colleagues. They should be honest and truthful, do sound work, be above board, and be just and upright. We must work to resolve problems with force and tenacity as a hammer drives a nail. We must make sure that we start well and end well and work wholeheartedly to produce the best possible results so as to achieve the greatest possible success in improving party conduct. Combat Corruption Power must be caged by the system. January 22nd, 2013 Main points of the speech at the second plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Commission for Discipline Inspection. All party members must act in compliance with the plan, plans made at the 18th CPC National Congress. Combat and prevent corruption in a more scientific and effective way and resolutely press ahead with the effort to improve party conduct, uphold integrity, and root out corruption. In the fight against corruption, we must adhere to the guidance of Deng Xiaoping theory, the important thought of the three represents, and the scientific outlook 
on development and follow the principle of addressing both symptoms and root causes, taking an integrated approach, met out punishment, and ensure prevention with the emphasis on the latter. We must strengthen our party if we are to fulfill the goals and tasks set out at its 18th National Congress, including the two centenary goals, and realize the Chinese dream of the great renewal of the Chinese nation. Improving party conduct, upholding integrity, and combating corruption are important tasks in the course of building the party. Only if we remain clean and upright in governance and exercise power in a fair way can we win public trust and support. Over the past 30 years since the reform and opening up policy was introduced, the party's second and third central leadership with Deng Xiaoping and Jiang Zemin at their respective cores and the party central committee with Hu Jintao as the general secretary consistently attached great importance to the task of improving party conduct, upholding integrity, and combating corruption. They maintain a clear stand against corruption, adopted effective measures against it, and made remarkable achievements which have played an important role in preserving and developing the party's advanced nature and purity, and provided a strong guarantee for the party's leadership in the reform and opening up effort, and the socialist modernization drive. Our party is by and large sound. Yet we must be fully aware that some areas are still prone to misconduct and corruption. Major cases of violation of party discipline and state laws have had serious adverse effects on society. The fight against corruption remains a serious challenge, and the people are dissatisfied with our work in many areas. Faced with the long-term complicated and arduous tasks, of improving party conduct, upholding integrity, and combating corruption, we must persevere in our anti-corruption effort and always remain vigilant against corruption and degeneracy. The key is to repeatedly stress the fight against corruption and make a long-term commitment. We must solidify our resolve, ensure that all cases of corruption are investigated, and prosecuted, and that all instances of graft are rectified, continue to remove the breeding grounds for corruption, and further win public trust by making real progress in the fight against corruption. Our party is a Marxist party, the organization of which relies on, the rev on revolutionary ideals and strict discipline. This has always been our party's fine tradition and unique advantage. The more complicated the situation and the heavier the tasks facing the party, the more we need to reinforce discipline and the more we need to safeguard unity within the party. In this way, we can ensure that the whole party is unified in terms of determination and synchronized in actions and progress. To run the party with strict discipline, we have to first and foremost implement strict political discipline, which in turn starts from observing and safeguarding the party constitution. The essence of observing the party's political discipline is to adhere to the party's leadership, basic theory, basic line, basic program, basic experience, and basic requirements. Keep in line with the party central committee and conscientiously safeguard its authority. All party members must keep in line with the party central committee intellectually and politically, as well as in their actions concerning the party's basic theories, guidelines, principles, and policies, and other matters of overall importance. Party organizations and officials at all levels must develop a holistic view and appropriately handle the relationship between ensuring smooth implementation of the central leadership's orders and policies 
and conducting work with an innovative spirit based on concrete conditions, making sure that all plans concerning local work and development are based on the prerequisite of implementing the central leadership's guidelines. We must prevent or, if necessary, rectify departmental and local protectionism and parochialism, and never allow local policies to trump central policies, the sidelining of government decrees or prohibitions, or perfunctory or selective enforcement of or accommodations in the enforcement of the central leadership's policy decisions and plans. Every party member, especially leading officials, must enhance his understanding of the party constitution, observe the constitution in both words and actions, and maintain in all circumstances a firm political belief, political stance, and political orientation. Party organizations at all levels must take the initiative to implement and safeguard the party's political discipline and raise party members' awareness of observing it. Party discipline inspection commissions at all levels must put priority on ensuring compliance with the party's political discipline and strengthen supervision and inspection on the implementation of political discipline. The issue of working style is in no sense a small one. If misconduct is not corrected but allowed to run rampant, it will build an invisible wall between our party and the people. As a result, our party will lose its base, lifeblood, and strength. Regarding the task of improving our working style, each effort counts but carrying on and furthering the spirit of hard struggle is of fundamental importance. The task of improving our working style is arduous. The eight rules provide us with a starting point and a call for us to improve our work practices. They are not the highest standards nor our ultimate goal, but the first step to improving our working style, as well as the basic requirement for communists. As a saying goes, he who is good at governing through restriction should first restrict himself, then others. Footnote 1. Shun Yue. History as a Mirror. Shin Jian. Shun Yue, 148-209, was a philosopher and historian of the Eastern Han Dynasty. End of footnote one. Officials at all levels must conduct themselves in an exemplary fashion, take the lead in improving their conduct and keep their promises. We must practice frugality in all aspects of our work and resolutely oppose waste, extravagance, and hedonism. We should vigorously carry out the fine tradition of thrift and hard work of the Chinese nation and advocate the ideas of taking pride in thrift and shame in waste so that a healthy atmosphere of practicing thrift and opposing waste will become predominant. All localities and departments must fully implement the relevant regulations on improving party conduct and implement these regulations in every aspect and in every link of our work. The people's satisfaction is the standard for measuring progress in changing our way of work. We must extensively solicit public opinions and suggestions, steadily accept public assessment and supervision by the whole of society, and make improvements in areas concerning which people have expressed dissatisfaction. The Central Commission for Discipline Inspection of the Party, the Ministry of Supervision and Party Discipline Inspection Commissions, and supervision departments at all levels must strengthen inspection and supervision to ensure that party discipline is implemented, accountability is maintained, and performance is ensured. We should fight corruption with strong determination. 
leave marks when we tread on stones or grasp iron. Persevere in our anti-corruption effort till we achieve final success. Rather than start off full of sound and fury and then taper off in a whimper. We must let the whole party and the people oversee power and demonstrate to the people continuous and real results and changes of party conduct and the combat of corruption. The resolute determination in punishing and wiping out corruption demonstrates the strength of our party and is a common aspiration of all party members and the public as well. The party has shown a firm determination and an unequivocal attitude in strictly investigating and prosecuting serious cases of violation of party discipline involving party members and officials, including some high-ranking ones. This is a clear signal to the whole party and the whole of society that anyone who violates party discipline and state laws Whoever he is, and whatever position he holds, will be fully investigated and severely punished. This is not empty talk. We must not let up one iota in terms of governing the party with strict discipline. We should continue to catch tigers as well as flies, when dealing with cases of leading officials in violation of party discipline and state laws, as well as misconduct and corruption problems that directly affect the people's livelihood. Footnote 2. Referring to high-ranking offenders, as well as petty ones. End of footnote 2. All are equal before the law and party discipline. Whoever is involved in a corruption case must be thoroughly and impartially investigated. We should continue to build a complete system of combating corruption through both punishment and prevention, strengthen education on combating corruption, and, uphold in, and upholding integrity, and promote the culture of clean government. We must improve the system of checking and overseeing the exercise of power, reinforce state legislation against corruption, improve intra-party rules, regulations, and institutions concerning the fight against corruption and upholding integrity, carry forward reforms in areas prone to corruption, and ensure that government agencies exercise their power in accordance with authorization and procedures. We must enhance checks and supervision over the exercise of power, make sure that power is caged by the system, and form a punishment mechanism to debtor corruption, a warning mechanism to prevent corruption, and a guarantee mechanism to curb corruption. Leading officials at all levels must bear firmly in mind the fact that nobody is above the law and that all officials must exercise state power to serve the people, be responsible to the people, and be supervised by the people. We must strengthen the monitoring of the first men in command, implement democratic centralism, increase transparency in administration, and ensure that leading officials do not act in a high-handed manner or seek personal gain. In combating corruption and upholding integrity, we must also oppose ideas and practices smacking of privilege. Members of the CPC are at all times ordinary members of the working people. Party members are only entitled to some personal benefits and job-related functions and powers prescribed by laws and policies, and must not seek any personal gain or privilege over and above those. The use of privilege is not only a major concern in our efforts to improve party conduct and build a clean government, but also a crucial problem that affects the parties and the state's capacity to preserve their vitality and vigor. We must adopt effective measures to resolutely oppose and curb ideas and instances of seeking privilege. We must mobilize the whole party to improve party conduct, uphold integrity, and combat corruption. 
within the scope of their functions and duties. Party committees at all levels should bear total leadership responsibility for improving party conduct and building a clean government. We must continue to implement and improve the party leadership system and working mechanism for combating corruption, give full play to the role of party discipline inspection commissions, supervised departments, and judiciary and auditing agencies, and work with them in a concerted effort to better improve party conduct, uphold integrity, and combat corruption. We must ensure support for party discipline inspection commissions and supervision agencies in performing their duties and show concern and care for people working at these commissions and agencies. We should pay special attention to protecting those who are fully aware of party spirit and are courageous enough to stick to principle and create conditions favorable for them to do their jobs. Party discipline inspection commissions and supervision agencies at all levels must also step up their efforts to build a contingent of honest officials and improve their capacity to carry out their functions and duties so that they can ensure better inspection and supervision. Historical wisdom helps us combat corruption and uphold integrity. April 19th, 2013. Main points of the speech at the fifth group study session of the Political Bureau of the 18th CPC Central Committee, which she presided over. We should not only draw on historical experiences, but also learn from them. We are confronted with a complex and volatile international situation and an arduous task of promoting reform, development, and stability. To fulfill the two centenary goals and realize the Chinese dream of the rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, we must ensure that the party supervises its own conduct and runs itself with strict discipline. We must draw upon the fine culture of clean government in Chinese history, steadily improve the party's leadership and governance skills, and become better able to combat corruption, prevent degeneracy, and ward off risks. We must also ensure that the party is always the firm leadership core guiding the cause of Chinese socialism. To improve party conduct, uphold integrity, and combat corruption, we need to continue the successful practices the party has long accumulated, learn from other countries' beneficial experiences, and draw upon the valuable legacy of Chinese history. China's history of combating corruption and its ancient anti-corruption culture offer enlightenment, as do the failures and successes of the past. This historical wisdom can help us do a better job in combating corruption and upholding integrity today. Through a thorough review of history in China and elsewhere, our party has realized that improving party conduct, upholding integrity, and combating corruption are vital for the survival of the party and the state. The key is to remain firmly reliant on the people, maintain close ties with them, and never become isolated from them. To achieve the, this, we must do everything in our power to address corruption and other negative phenomena. See to it that the party always identifies itself with the people and shares their concerns and ultimately their destiny. The CPC Central Committee has called upon us to improve our working practices by opposing formalism, bureaucratism, hedonism, and extravagance. This serves as, as a focus for combating corruption and upholding integrity, as well as a starting point for consolidating popular support for the party's governance. All party members must understand the political importance of this issue, stay alert, strictly adhere to the two musts, improve our working practices, and crack down on corruption with a strong determination. We must leave our mark like leaving our mark when we tread on stones or grasp steel, and continue to win popular trust with new victories in the fight against corruption. 
We must raise public awareness of the need to combat corruption and uphold integrity, promote a culture of clean government, and combine the rule of law with the rule of virtue. Starting by improving moral and intellectual standards will be of fundamental importance because moral purity is essential for Marxist parties to stay pure, and moral integrity is a fundamental trait for officials to remain clean, honest, and upright. We should guide and encourage party members and officials to adhere to their convictions and ideals, be intellectually firm as communists, become morally stronger to pursue clean government and build up their psychological defenses against corruption and degeneracy. We should improve party members and officials intellectually and theoretically, strengthen education in and fostering of the party spirit and bolster ethics. We should guide them in studying and applying Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, and the system of theories of socialism with Chinese characteristics in developing a solid worldview and a healthy outlook on power and career, and in being model practitioners of the socialist maxims of honor and disgrace. Footnote 1. On March 4, 2006, Hu Jintao attended a group meeting of the fourth session of the 10th National Committee of the Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference and held discussions with committee members of the China Democratic League and China Association for Promoting Democracy. At the meeting, he put forth the socialist maxims of honor and disgrace which consist of the following eight maxims. Loving the motherland is honorable, and harming it is disgraceful. Serving the people is honorable, and ignoring them is disgraceful. Respect for science is honorable, and ignorance is disgraceful. Working hard is honorable, and being lazy is disgraceful. Working with and helping others is honorable and profiting at their expense is disgraceful. Being honest and trustworthy is honorable, and sacrificing principles for profit is disgraceful. Being law-abiding and disciplined is honorable, and violating the law and discipline is disgraceful. Living a simple life is honorable, and living extravagantly is disgraceful. End of footnote one. Theoretical study and improvement will ensure that party members and officials are fully committed to their work, and high moral standards will help them to stay clear-minded in exercising state power. In this way, we can also help party members and officials increase their awareness of the party's purpose of serving the people wholeheartedly and always preserve the noble character and political integ integrity of communists. Institutions are of fundamental, overall, and long-lasting importance and are closely related to the stability of the country. The solution to the problem of corruption is to improve the system that checks and oversees the exercise of power, grant oversight powers to the people, and make the exercise of power more transparent and institutionalized. We should prevent and fight corruption more properly and effectively. Establish a complete system for preventing and combating corruption and work harder to ensure the stringent enforcement of anti-corruption laws and discipline. We should analyze typical cases thoroughly, strengthen reform in areas prone to corruption, improve our institutions and systems to reduce loopholes to an absolute minimum, and eliminate any breeding grounds for corruption through further reform. We must tirelessly combat corruption and always remain vigilant against it. We should keep it in mind that many worms will disintegrate wood and a big enough crack will lead to the collapse of a wall. Footnote 2. The Book of Lord Shang, Shang Jun Shu, 
This book is a representative legalist work by Shang Yang and his followers. It is also an important basis for research into the legal philosophy of the Shang Yang school. Shang Yang, circa 390 to 338 BC, was a statesman, thinker, and major representative of the legalists in the middle period of the warring states. He initiated a series of reforms in the state of Chen. These reforms, known as the reforms of Lord Shang, introduced a new feudal system in the state of Chen and made the state prosperous and strong within a short period of time. End of footnote 2. We must be tough in cracking down on corruption and ensure that all cases of corruption are investigated and that all corrupt officials are punished, catching tigers as well as flies, senior officials as well as junior ones guilty of corruption. In this way, we will effectively protect the legitimate rights and interests of the people and see to it that our officials remain honest and upright, that the government remains clean, and that political integrity is upheld. Improve party conduct, uphold integrity, and combat corruption. January 14th, 2014. Main points of the speech at the third plenary session of the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection of the 18th CPC Central Committee. We should adhere to the principle that the party should supervise its own conduct and run itself with strict discipline and strengthen the party's leadership in improving party conduct, upholding integrity, and combating corruption. We should improve our institutions to better fight against corruption. We must also redouble our efforts in political and intellectual education reinforce stricter party discipline, continue to remove formalism, bureaucratism, hedonism, and extravagance, be severe in cracking down on corruption, and respond to the demands of the people. In 2013, the CPC Central Committee made it a priority to improve party conduct, uphold integrity, and combat corruption. In compliance with the decisions and plans made by the Central Committee, the Central Commission for Discipline Inspection has fought firmly against corruption by strengthening party discipline, especially by reinforcing political discipline, enhancing oversight of enforcement, and improving investigation into and prosecution of corruption cases. Through the concerted efforts of party committees, governments, discipline inspection commissions, and supervisory agencies at all levels, progress has been made in improving party conduct, ensuring clean government, and combating corruption. The campaign started with the Political Bureau of the CPC Central Committee, emphasizing the exemplary role of the Political Bureau. We started to eliminate malpractices and promote integrity by solving pressing problems, and we have made remarkable progress. In resolutely dealing with cases of corruption, we have caught tigers as well as flies, and thus maintained a tough stance against corrupt officials. We have promoted procedure-based exercise of power, strengthened oversight and, and inspection, and opened up channels for public complaint and oversight. All of this has been well received by both officials and the general public. While affirming our achievements, we must also be aware that there are still breeding grounds for corruption. The fight against corruption remains a serious and complex challenge. Instances of misconduct and corruption have had an adverse effect on society, and they must be immediately addressed. The whole party must realize that the fight against corruption is a long-term, complex, and arduous task. We must be firm in our determination and demonstrate great courage in carrying this campaign through to the end. Just as we would take a heavy dose of medicine to treat a serious disease, we must apply stringent laws to address disorder. 
establishing a sound system of combating corruption through both punishment and prevention represents our national strategy. In 2013, the Central Committee issued the work plan for establishing a complete system of combating corruption through both punishment and prevention, 2013 to 2017. This is the document that guides our strategy. Party committees at all levels must thoroughly implement the demands of this document, which is an important political task throughout our efforts to promote reform, development, and stability. In terms of maintaining the intimate, the intimate relationship between the party and the people, we cannot expect to treat this as a one-off campaign and then rest on our laurels. It must be a continuous and relentless effort. Fortunately, we have already got off to a good start and we can take it forward from here in steps. If we want to develop a healthy party culture, we must first and foremost have firm beliefs and bear in mind the party's nature, fundamental goals, and requirements of officials. As officials under the leadership of the party, we must separate public and personal interests and put public interests above personal interests. Only if we always act for the public good can we be honest and upright in our conduct and remain clean and prudent in exercising power. Problems of misconduct often involve the handling of private and public interests and misuse of public funds and state power. Public funds must be used for public purposes, and not one cent should be spent on seeking personal gain. State power must be exercised for the people, and it must never be used as a tool for private benefit. Officials must always bear this in mind, make a clear distinction between public and private interests, devote themselves to serving the public, and impose strict self-discipline. To fight resolutely against corruption and prevent the party from succumbing to decay and degeneration through overlong access to power are two major political tasks that we must work hard on. We must remain resolute in wiping out corruption and show zero tolerance for it. Once a corrupt official is identified, we must conduct a thorough investigation. The important thing is to take measures to prevent and curb corruption in its earliest stage of development, addressing problems of corruption as soon as they are found, in the same way as we treat a disease promptly when it is diagnosed. Any delay in dealing with corruption may lead to more serious problems and must not be allowed. Every official must bear the following in mind. Do not try dipping into the public coffers because a thieving hand is bound to get caught. Footnote 1. Chen Yi. Keep your hands in your own pockets. Selected Poems of Chen Yi. Chinese Edition. People's Literature Publishing House. Beijing. 1977. Page 155. Chen Yi. 1901 to 1972, was a Chinese proletarian revolutionary, military commander, and political leader, and one of the founders and leaders of the People's Liberation Army, and one of the marshals of the People's Republic of China. End of footnote one. And contemplating good and pursuing it as if you could not reach it, contemplating evil and shrinking from it, as you would from thrusting a hand into boiling water. Footnote 2. The Analects of Confucius. Lun Yu. End of footnote 2. Officials must be in awe of party discipline and state laws, rather than trust to luck in the hope of escaping punishment for corruption. We must improve party conduct, uphold integrity, and combat corruption through further reform. 
We must reform the party's discipline inspection system, improve the system and mechanisms for combating corruption, double the effectiveness of oversight over and restraint on power, and ensure the independence and authority of discipline inspection commissions at all levels. We must improve checks on power, distribute power in a scientific way, and form an effective framework for the exercise of power. We must strengthen oversight with focus on officials, giving particular attention to those first in command and how they exercise their power, and intensify mutual oversight within leadership. We must increase transparency, publicize the procedures through which power is exercised in accordance with the law, and let the people oversee the exercise of power so as to ensure that it is properly used. In combating corruption, party committees should be duty-bound, while discipline inspection commissions should take on supervisory responsibilities. They all should strengthen the accountability system to prevent our institutions from becoming a facade. All party committees, party discipline inspection commissions, and other relevant departments must fulfill their responsibilities. In adopting reform measures, we should keep in mind the task of combating corruption through both punishment and prevention, synchronize reform measures with the fight against corruption at all stages from preparation to deployment and implementation, so as to close all possible loopholes and ensure the smooth progress of reform. Our compliance with party discipline should be unconditional. We must turn our words into actions and make sure that party discipline is fully implemented and any violation is investigated. We must not allow our findings to become a dusty document resting on the top shelf. Party organizations at all levels must increase awareness of the need to abide by the party's political principles, and discipline inspection commissions at all levels must see their priority as safeguarding the party's political discipline so as to ensure that all party members align themselves with the CPC Central Committee intellectually and politically, as well as in their actions. The party draws its strengths from its organization and is constantly invigorated by it. In order to reinforce the party's organizational discipline, we must enhance our party spirit, which is a matter of taking a firm stance. We communists, especially leading officials, must be broad-minded and aim high. We must always bear in mind the interests of the party, the people, and the country conscientiously uphold the party spirit and stick to our principles. All party members must always remember that we are first and foremost CPC members and our primary duties are to work for it, remain loyal to it, and at all times identify ourselves with it. All party members must always remember that we are part of the organization and never neglect our duties and responsibilities to the organization. We must trust, rely on, and obey the organization, readily accept organizational arrangements and disciplinary restraints, and safeguard the unity of the party. Democratic centralism and the system of intra-party organization activities are important institutions of the party and must be fully implemented. Leading bodies and officials at all levels must rigorously follow the reporting system. We must reinforce organizational management of party members and guide all party members and officials in developing a correct attitude towards the party organization, matching our deeds to our words, speaking the truth, and embracing the party organization's education and oversight. Party organizations at all levels must fully observe organizational discipline, make no exceptions in this regard, and have the moral fiber to denounce and rectify violations of party discipline to preserve it as a high-tension line of deterrence. 
policies and plans made by the Party Central Committee should be implemented not only by the party's organization departments, publicity departments, United Front departments, and judicial, procuratorial, and public security bodies, but also by party organizations in People's Congresses, Governance, CPPCC committees, People's Courts, and People's Procuratorates at all levels, as well as by party organizations in public institutions and people's organizations. All such party organizations must fulfill their duty in this regard. Party organizations in general must be accountable to party committees, report their work to party committees, and perform their work to the full extent of their functions and duties under the leadership of party committees. The CPC Leadership Follow a Good Blueprint February 28, 2013 Part of the speech at the second meeting of the second plenary session of the 18th CPC Central Committee Confronted with the arduous and heavy tasks of promoting reform, development, and stability, leading groups and leading officials at all levels must act in line with the requirements of the Party Central Committee. Bear in mind that empty talk harms the country while hard work makes it flourish, and work energetically and productively to accomplish concrete deeds that can stand the test of practice and survive the scrutiny of the people and history. On our immensely large platform of reform, opening up, and modernization drive, all of us are desirous of doing something, even big things, to prove ourselves trustworthy to the party and the people. Yet, we should also understand that, while doing that, we must maintain proper continuity in governance. An official in charge of a certain area and for a certain duration should act boldly and effectively in work, but he should also ensure consistency and continuity in the work. The 18th CPC National Congress laid down the goal for completing the building of a moderately prosperous society in all respects, furthering the reform and opening up, made an overall arrangement for promoting socialism with Chinese characteristics in the new conditions, and put forth clear requirements to make party building more scientific in an all-round way. Now it is time for the whole party and people of the whole country to make concerted and relentless efforts to implement the spirit of the 18th CPC National Congress. Likewise, we must also remain committed to implementing the guidelines, principles, and policies formulated since the third plenary session of the 11th Party Central Committee. Ding Xiaoping Theory, the important thought of the three represents, and the scientific outlook on development, and all the major strategic arrangements made by the Central Committee, which are to be implemented in real earnest. The same is true in treating work at local and departmental levels. We have already got in our hands a good blueprint. What we should do is follow it through to the end and make it a success. In this regard, we need to have a nail spirit. When we use a hammer to drive in a nail, a single knock often may not be enough. We must keep knocking until it is well in place. Then we can proceed to knock the next one and continue driving in nails till the job is done completely. If we knock here and there without focusing on the nail, we may end up squandering our efforts altogether. There is no use in saying, I won't get the credit for success. If a blueprint is good, factually based, scientifically sound, and well received by the people, we should keep working on it one administration after another, and the outcome of our work will be real and appreciated and remembered by the people. Of course, as practice evolves continuously, 
Our thoughts and work should keep up with the changing times, and when we are absolutely sure, we can make adjustments and improvements in good time. Nevertheless, we must not allow a complete unraveling of policies just because a new leadership takes office, nor must we permit a separate agenda with empty fancy slogans flying all over the place just to show so-called achievements. Under most circumstances, a new look or new atmosphere in work are not related to formulating new plans or designing new slogans. Rather, they come about naturally when earnest, down-to-earth efforts are made to turn scientifically sound goals in the good blueprint in the real into reality by taking stock of new conditions, adopting new ideas, and employing new measures. Our officials should have a clear understanding of job performance, thinking more about working to lay a solid foundation which is conducive to long-term development, and less about competing pointlessly with others, still less about building wasteful showcase projects to prop up their own image. Let our officials be true and practical, dedicated to work, and bold to shoulder their responsibilities, so as to live up to the expectations of history and the people. Study for a Brighter Future March 1, 2013 Main part of the speech at the Celebration Assembly of the 80th Anniversary of the Central Party School and the Opening Ceremony of its 2013 Spring Semester. Our party has always worked to ensure that all its party members especially leading officials, acquire further knowledge. This has proved to be useful for developing the cause of the party and the people. At every major turning point, when faced with new circumstances and tasks, the party has called upon its members to study harder. Each time, it has brought about big changes and developments for the cause of the party and the people. At the very beginning of reform and opening up in 1978, the party central committee stressed that achieving the four modernizations, modernization of agriculture, industry, national defense, and science and technology is a great and profound revolution. We will have to move forward in this revolution by continuously solving new problems. Therefore, all party members must study and then study some more. Compared with the past, we have more to study today, not less, because of the new circumstances and tasks confronting us. At present, the entire party must clearly understand and properly handle the new situations and problems arising from the development of the country. This is an important challenge. Some of the problems we face today are old, either problems that we have long failed to solve properly or old problems with new manifestations. But most of our problems are new. The reason why new and unfamiliar problems keep surfacing is because of the changes in the world, in our country, and in our party. The best possible way to understand and address the problems, whether they are new or old, long-standing or old ones, in new form, is to enhance our capabilities through study. In the process of study, we should not only put what we know into practice, but also acquire new pr practical problem-solving skills. The various goals and tasks set by the 18th Party National Congress including adapting ourselves to a complex and volatile international situation, safeguarding overall reform, development and stability, and doing good work in all areas, impose new demands on party members' capabilities. Throughout its history of revolution, construction, and reform, our party has encountered numerous difficulties, and what has been achieved in our cause has come from painstaking explorations, 
and hard work. There is simply no possibility that we can advance our cause and achieve our goals without ever encountering any impediment. It can be anticipated that various difficulties, risks, and challenges will continue to surface on our way forward. The key lies in our ability to resolve, manage, and conquer them. Generally speaking, in some areas, our abilities already meet the demands of the development of the party and the country, but in others, they are inadequate. As the circumstances and challenges we face continue to change, we become less capable of responding to their demands. If we do not improve our professional level at every opportunity, over time we will lose the ability to fulfill the arduous tasks of leadership in reform and opening up and socialist modernization. During the Yan'an period, our party became aware of its dread of incompetence. The party central committee pointed out clearly that our parties, that our people suffered a dread. It was not an economic or political dread, but a dread of incompetence. The limited bank of abilities accumulated over the years and had been depleted with each passing day. And the coffers were empty. Are we faced with the same problem today? My answer is yes. Many people have the aspiration to do their work well and are full of enthusiasm, but they are lacking in the abilities required to achieve this in changing circumstances. In response to new circumstances and problems, they cling to old patterns of thinking and old practices. The problem stems from ignorance of general trends and new approaches, as well as inadequate knowledge and abilities. They rush headlong into their work and act blindly. As a result, although they are conscientious in their work and spare themselves no effort, they either take the wrong approach or act in a way that defeats their purpose, or even head south while their chariot is pointing north. In such cases, it is often the case that our people have no alternative when the tried and trusted methods fail, or they dare not adopt sterner measures when soft ones prove inadequate. In my opinion, this will continue to be the case for a long time to come. Therefore, all members, especially those in positions of leadership at all levels, must have a sense of crisis and constantly improve their professional competence. Only by doing this can we achieve the two centenary goals and make the Chinese dream of national rejuvenation come true. Nobody is born with knowledge. We all have to acquire it through study and practice. In modern times, knowledge is becoming outdated at an ever-increasing pace with a whole range of new know-how, new information, and new states of affairs cascading over us. Academics have noted that up to the 18th century, the body of human knowledge doubled within a period of around 90 years. Since the 1990s, there has been an exponential acceleration in this process. The body of human knowledge is now estimated to double every three to five years. The amount of knowledge produced by human society over the past 50 years exceeds the aggregate generated over the past previous 3,000 years. It is also believed that in the age of agro-farming, a few years of study sufficed for one's lifetime. In the age of industrial economy, one had to study for at least 10 years to obtain all the knowledge necessary for one's life, and in this age of knowledge economy, one has to keep up with the times through lifelong study. If we fail to improve our knowledge in a wide variety of areas, if we do not take the initiative to learn about science and culture, if we are unwilling to conscientiously update our knowledge and improve our knowledge structure, develop the broadest possible perspective and broaden our horizons, we will not improve our professional competence. As a consequence, we will not be able to grasp the initiative 
and prevail. Ultimately, the future will pass us by. Therefore, all party members, especially leading officials at all levels, must have a sense of urgency and study more. It is precisely from this strategic perspective that the 18th Party National Congress highlighted the important task of building the party into a learning, service-oriented, and innovative Marxist governing party. Studying should be placed first because it is a prerequisite fund of knowledge with which we will be able to better serve the people and stay innovative. Since we are all leading officials who shoulder duties and responsibilities entrusted to us by the party and the people, we have to constantly raise our professional level, enrich our knowledge, dedicate ourselves to our work, and improve all aspects of our performance. Whether or not leading officials improve themselves through study is not only a personal matter, but a big issue concerning the development of the cause of the party and the country. An ancient scholar expressed it thus, one may or may not study for the purpose of becoming an official, but officials must be learned to fulfill their duties. Footnote 1. Shunzi. End of footnote 1. We must study in order to improve our ability to work in a more scientific way, with greater foresight and initiative, and to keep up with the times, follow the law of development, and be innovative in our leadership and policy making. We must study in order to avoid bewilderment resulting from inadequate knowledge, blindness resulting from insensibility, and chaos resulting from ignorance. We must also study in order to overcome professional deficiencies, the dread of incompetence and outdated capabilities. Otherwise, we are no better than the blind man on a blind horse who is in danger of falling into a deep pool at night. Footnote 2. Liu Yi Ching, New Accounts of Tales of the World, Shi Shuo Shen Yu, Liu Yi Ching, 403 to 444, was a man of letters of the state of Song during the Southern Dynasty, 420 to 589. New Accounts of Tales of the World is a literary collection of words and stories of scholar bureaucrats from the late Han Dynasty. 206 BC to AD 220 to the Eastern Jin Dynasty, 317 to 420. End of footnote 2. An imprudent and inadvisable course of action, however courageous. This could lead us to failure in work, losing our way and falling behind the times. The cause of building Chinese socialism is a great and unprecedented undertaking. Therefore, our approach to study should be comprehensive, systematic, and exploratory. We should have focus in our study and widen the scope of our knowledge. We should learn both from books and through practice. We should learn from ordinary people, from experts and scholars, and draw upon beneficial experiences of foreign countries as well. We should nourish ourselves with both theoretical and practical knowledge. First of all, we should study Marxist theory. This is a special requirement that will help us to work well and also a necessary requirement that will equip leading officials to excel in leadership. Mao Zedong once stated, our party's fighting capacity will be much greater if there are 100 or 200 comrades with a grasp of Marxism-Leninism, which is systematic and not fragmentary, genuine and not hollow. Footnote 3. Mao Zedong, the role of the Chinese Communist Party in the National War. Selected Works of Mao Zedong, Volume 2, English Edition, Foreign Languages Press, Beijing, 1975, page 209. End of footnote 3. 
This task still confronts our party today. We must acquire a true grasp of Marxism-Leninism, Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, the important thought of the three represents, and the scientific outlook on development. And we must especially have a good understanding of the Marxist stand, viewpoint, and method that permeate all these ideas. This can enable us to remain sharp-eyed and clear-minded and gain a profound understanding of the laws of the development of human society, the laws of building socialism, and the laws of governance by the CPC. This can help us stay firm in our ideals and convictions and adhere to the correct guiding thoughts and hold to the correct orientation in any complex situation. This can also enable us to lead the people along the correct road and make progress in building Chinese socialism. Leading officials must study the party's guidelines, principles, and policies, and the country's laws and regulations. An understanding of, the, of these is a basic preparation we must make for our work. And it is also a political attainment we must have. Without this body of knowledge, how can we make policy decisions and solve problems? And we may even end up with mistakes in our work. Leading officials at all levels should study the history of both the party and the country and remain patriotic and dedicated to them. We should study the development of the party and the country, draw upon their historical experiences, and understand major events and figures in the history of the party and the country. History is the best textbook, so studying it will teach us to understand the country and the party, and open up the gates to a brighter future. Leading officials should study economics, politics, history, culture, science and technology, and knowledge of social, military, and foreign affairs related to their work. They should become more knowledgeable and more professionally competent. They should learn what they need in their work and study what they do not know, and acquire knowledge that is conducive to leadership and high performance. In doing so, they will become experts as well as better leaders in their fields. Leading officials should also study history and culture, especially traditional Chinese culture, to develop wisdom and become more refined. Traditional Chinese culture is, bo is both extensive and profound, and to acquire the essence of various thoughts is beneficial to the formation of a correct worldview, outlook on life, and sense of values. Our ancient scholars commented that our aspirations should be as follows. In politics, being the first to worry about the affairs of the state, and the last to enjoy oneself. Footnote 4. See note 3, page 68. End of footnote 4. As patriots, not daring to ignore the country's peril, no matter how humble one's position. Footnote 5. Lu Yo. Feelings after illness. End of footnote 5. And doing everything possible to save the country in its peril without regard to personal fortune or misfortune. Footnote 6. Lin Zhe Shu. Farewell to my family on my way to exile. Lin Zhe Shu. 1785 to 1850, was a patriot and statesman of the Qing dynasty who advocated resistance to Western invasion and a ban on the non-medicinal consumption of opium during the Opium War. End of footnote 6. On integrity, Never being corrupted by riches and honors, never departing from principle despite poverty or humble origin, and never submitting to force or threat. Footnote 7. Dementius Mengzi. End of footnote 7.
On selfless dedication, dying with a loyal heart, shining in the pages of history. Footnote 8. Win Tian Cheng, passing Ling Ding Yang. Win Tian Cheng, 1236-1283, was a minister and writer of the Southern Song Dynasty, 1127-1279. End of footnote 8. And giving all till the heart beats its last. Footnote line. Zhuge Liang. Second petition on taking the field. Ho Chu Shi Biao. End of footnote 9. These maxims reflect the fine traditions and spirit of the Chinese nation, and we should all keep them alive and have them further developed. Leading officials should also study literature. They should refine their tastes and develop uplifting interests through appreciation of works of literature and art. Many revolutionaries of the older generation had a profound literary background and were well versed in poetry. In short, history helps us understand the failures and successes of the past and learn lessons from the rise and fall of states. Poetry stimulates us, sends our dreams skywards, and makes us witty. Integrity improves our judgment and helps us cultivate a sense of honor and disgrace. We should not only study Chinese history and culture, but also open our eyes to the rest of the world and learn about the histories and cultures of other peoples. We should give preference to what is uplifting in these histories and cultures and reject what is base, obtaining enlightenment and employing it for our own use. Leading officials must direct their studies correctly. If they deviate from the guiding principle of Marxism, they will be studying without a clear aim and may go astray. They might easily become confused when the situation becomes complex and might fall victim to defective thinking. Depart from the correct orientation, they might not only fail to acquire sound knowledge, but also find themselves deceived and misled by tempting fallacies and ideas that are unrealistic, ridiculous, or absurd. The purpose of study lies in practice. The ultimate goal of leading officials who dedicate greater effort to their studies lies in honing their capability in work and in solving problems. A Chinese saying goes like this, empty talk harms the country while hard work makes it flourish. This demands real efforts in both study and work. We all should bear in mind the historical lessons of Zhao Ko of the Warring States period, 475 to 221 BC, who fought all his battles on paper, or the scholars of the Western and Eastern Jin dynasties, 265 to 420, who became ineffective due to spending too much time in useless debates. Footnote 10. Zhao Ko unknown to 260 BC, a high-ranking military officer of the state of Zhao during the Warring States period was an armchair strategist without any real experience of battle. In 260 BC, he fell into a trap set by Bai Qi, a general of the state of Chen, and found his army surrounded by the enemy in Changping. Zhao Ko failed to break through the encirclement, and was killed. More than 400,000 Zhao soldiers were captured and buried alive. End of footnote 10. Reading and application are both ways of learning, 
and the latter is more important. Leading officials should adopt the Marxist approach by combining theory with practice. In the course of their studies, there should always be questions in mind. We should respect the people as our mentors, learn from work, and work on the basis of learning, making use of what we have learned, and applying it to real-life situations. Study and practice should always promote each other. We should disdain empty talk and never be a cricoon. A genuine interest in the subject is the best teacher. This concept is reflected in a Chinese saying, Regarding knowledge, those who are devoted to it learn better than those who are aware of it, and those who enjoy it the most are the best students. Footnote 11. The Analects of Confucius. Lun Yu. End of footnote 11. Leading officials should pursue study as a quest, a hobby, and an element of a healthy lifestyle which will make them happy and eager to learn. With a keen interest in study, we will be enthusiastic volunteers rather than reluctant conscripts, and study will be a lifelong habit instead of a temporary pastime. Study and deliberation complement each other, as do study and practice. As another Chinese saying goes, Reading without thinking makes one muddled. Thinking without reading makes one flighty. Footnote 12, see note 37, page 199. End of footnote 12. If you have problems in mind and want to find solutions, you should start studying and study conscientiously. You must learn extensively, inquire earnestly, Think profoundly, discriminate clearly, and practice sincerely. Footnote 13, see note 40, page 199. We should be adept at making time for study. I often hear officials say that they would love to study more, but they just don't have time because of their busy work schedules. This sounds superficially plausible, but it can never be an excuse for slackening in study. In stressing the need to improve our work, the Party Central Committee has suggested that we spend more time thinking and studying, and cut down on meaningless banquets and formalities. These days, there is a general public grievance that some officials do more partying than studying. Those in the dark are in no position to light the way for others. Footnote 14. The Mencius. Mungza. This will have an adverse effect on our work and will ultimately hinder our overall development. If we bury our heads in our work to the detriment of our studies, we run the risk of mental sclerosis and vulgarization. When engaged in study, we should be focused and avoid distractions. Our approach should be persistent and not that of the dilettante. We must gain a true grasp of what we are studying, rather than reading superficially without understanding. Leading officials must place a high priority on learning and studying assiduously. As long as we apply ourselves, even half an hour of reading a day, just a few pages will add up over time. In summary, study makes progress. To a large extent, we Chinese communists have relied on learning for our achievements, and we will surely continue to do so in the future. If our officials, our party, our country, and our people are to make progress, we must be advocates of learning. We must study, study, then study some more. And we must practice, practice, then practice some more. Governing a big country is as delicate as frying a small fish. March 19th, 2013.
part of the answers to a joint interview by the press of the BRICS countries. When I meet foreign leaders, one question they often ask in amazement is this. How can one govern such a large country as China? Indeed, it is not easy to govern a country with 1.3 billion people. Just getting to know the situation there can be a really difficult task. As I often say, it takes a good deal of effort to know China, and just visiting a place or two is not really enough. China has 9.6 million square kilometers of land, 56 ethnic groups, and a total of 1.3 billion people. Thus, when trying to learn about China, one needs to guard against drawing conclusions based on partial information. An ancient Chinese proverb says, Prime ministers must have served as local officials and great generals must have risen from the ranks. Footnote 1. Han Fei Zhe. Han Fei, circa 280-233 BC, was the major representative of the legalist school in the late Warring States period. His works were collected in the book Han Fei Zhe. End of footnote 1. Our mechanism for selecting officials in China also requires work experience at local levels. For instance, I once worked in a rural area as a party secretary at a production brigade. Later I served in various posts at county, municipal, provincial, and central levels. Extensive experience gained from working at local levels can help officials develop a sound attitude towards the people know what the country is really like and what the people really need, be better versed in various jobs and professions, and become more competent and effective for meeting future requirements for good work performance. There is a tremendous amount of work to do in meeting people's daily needs, ensuring the smooth running of society and the normal functioning of the state apparatus and building and managing the governing party. As the people have given me this job, I must always keep them in the highest place in my heart, bearing in mind their deep trust and the heavy responsibilities they have placed on me. In such a big, populous, and complicated country as ours, we the leaders must have an in-depth knowledge of the national conditions and learn what the people think and what they want. We must act self-consciously and with the utmost care, as if we were treading on thin ice and standing on the edge of an abyss. Footnote 2, the Book of Songs, Shi Jing. End of footnote 2. We must cultivate an attitude of governing a big country is as delicate as frying a small fish. Footnote 3, Lao Zi, Dao De Jing. End of footnote 3. Never slackening our efforts or being negligent in the slightest, and always devoting ourselves to work and the public interest. The people are where we draw our strength. As long as we stand with our people, through thick and thin, there will be no difficulty that can't be overcome, and no task that can't be accomplished. As for my workload, you can well imagine that working in such a job can hardly leave me any free time. There are so many things crying out to be done. Of course I try to prioritize my work. Many hands make light work. We have within the central leadership an effective mechanism featuring both division of labor and coordination. So we go about our respective duties while working in concert to get the job done properly. Though very busy, most of the time I manage to snatch a little leisure here and there. Whenever I have time, I spend it with my family. Footnote 4. Li Shi, written on the wall of the monks' quarters in Hailin Temple. Li Shi, dates unknown was a poet of the Tang dynasty. I have quite a few hobbies, and, most, and my most favorite one is reading, which has become a way of life. 
I am also a sports fan. I like swimming and hiking, and when I was young, I enjoyed playing football and volleyball. I wish to congratulate Brazil for hosting the FIFA World Cup again. What makes sports competitions, especially football matches, fascinating is their unpredictability. During the last World Cup, we had Paul the Octopus. I wonder if there will be another octopus next year to predict match results. The Brazilian team has the home ground advantage, and I wish them good luck.